I'm Amy. I'm your hike guide for today up in Newport Bay Nature Preserve, the Delhi and West Bluff Trails. And uh, Melanie Schlatterbeck is my trail sweep. And that means that she will be handling uh, a lot of the, the busy work for me. And uh, this view is actually, I'm trying to buy a little time for the latecomers. This view is actually taken, uh, I don't want to reveal too much, but out in the, uh, from a spot on the water, uh, we'll say, looking uh, at something we're going to be talking quite about. In fact, we can actually see if we knew what to look at, the hike uh, beginning from, from this slide. So with that, I think uh, here we go. So today's hike, these are some of the, uh, the highlights that we'll be touching on. Um, I am on the board of Friends of Harbors, Beaches and Parks. Melanie is a consultant there. We're going to be talking about Upper Newport Bay, Nature Preserve, the watershed, the estuary, and habitat types, birds at the bay, and some of the adaptations. I, um, I'm a naturalist. I'm not a, any kind of uh, ecologist or ologist, but uh, I, I know a fair amount about the marsh birds and upland birds and and how so many species can, can coexist within a relatively small area. And then as kind of a bonus, because I know uh, uh, we, we have folks from all over the place, I'm, um, I did a little vistas tour where we do a, a counterclockwise tour, kind of taking off where, uh, um, some sites from where we stop and continuing around the bay, uh, not quite a 360, but a, um, a fair amount of sites. And some housekeeping. Uh, this hike is being recorded, and uh, if you, whether you're leaving early or just want to rewatch it with friends, um, this video will be posted on our YouTube channel. As you've probably discovered, uh, you are muted, and um, that, that's basically kind of just the nature of the beast kind of thing. So Melanie and myself are the only ones uh, who, who can talk here. Um, but we have a chat feature available for you to ask questions, and we encourage you to do so. If we don't get to them all uh, during the course of the, the hike, we will uh, have time afterwards. Hopefully, you can hang on and ask it uh, at that time as well. So a, a jet, when you go into the chat, direct your questions to Melanie Schlotterbeck. So there's the chat in red at the bottom and you would type in Melanie's name over there to the right. And you have different ways that you can view it. Um, you can you just you know, play with it a little bit and, and, and select what's comfortable for you. Again, you are muted. And uh, if you wanna be extra comfortable, you, you don't need uh, to let us see you, but uh, if, if you wanna share your image, that's fine too. Uh, that's the one thing that, that I do miss, I guess, about um, not having an in-person hike is the, the chance to see everybody and, and uh, you know, uh, that little chatter at the beginning. But uh, these are the times and hopefully next year we, uh, we may do a, a mix of both next year. We don't know. That's a, a long ways off. And we are the Friends of Harbors, Beaches and Parks. Uh, this is an old name that uh, OC Parks had and we, we kept that name when uh, when they did their name change because that's, that's what we were known by at that time. And our, our mission essentially is to promote and protect the natural lands, waterways and beaches of Orange County. And in this image we're doing so, uh, we have several kinds of outreach, the virtual hikes, the hikes are one, but we also do um, like acorn days, I think is what this is at uh, O'Neill Park. And we do, um, I, for Newport Bay, we've done Earth Day there before. so. We get around a little bit to, to meet folks in the community. Oh, I went past one. So this is the green vision map. The green vision map is the conservation vision of Orange County. We assembled a coalition of over 80 environmental groups that support efforts to find and create funding for parks, water quality, and open space. We've also negotiated with Orange County Transit Authority's renewed Measure M to fund over 243 million of conservation acquisition and restoration projects. To date, over 13 acres, 1300 acres have been preserved and the restoration of 300 and 
50 acres funded. And we also do uh, research and so forth, policies, uh, general plans, climate change, uh, climate impacts and published reports. And these toolkits teach the public and planners how to engage government to adopt important policies and improve conservation outcomes. And this is us, this is the, uh, the hiking subcommittee, if you will. Mike Wellborn, the president of our organization is in the top. Uh, myself over in the corner and uh, down below we have Nina Brown and Maureen Gates, uh, two of our board members and there's Melanie over there uh, upper left. And she is a consultant, one of our consultants that we have with our organization. So where are we? Well, we're smack dab in, in the midst of a whole lot of peoples. Um, we're surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. Not so many people there, but uh, Costa Mesa, Irvine, Newport Beach. Um, those of you who've seen this image before can probably uh, uh, place various locations on there. And we'll be, we'll be going through it in a little bit more detail. Um, upper, upper left, uh, if we had a little bit more of an extended view, would be the Santa Ana River. So um, the only reason I mentioned that is because we're talking about uh, a little bit of history and estuary. So we'll, we'll come back to that point later. And how do I get there? That's gonna depend where you're coming from and where you want to visit. If you're wanting to visit the area we took this hike that is shown here on uh, something we pulled from the Vega OC Parks map of the, the site. And so if you're coming from the ocean, you have one route. If you're coming from one of the two freeways shown, you have another, another access point. Um, Jamboree would be kind of the long way around uh, at that point. Um, so I better for the east side. So just uh, either uh, check, check the website uh, that they have, give a call or um, Google. And, uh, and when, you, when you know the hike route that you want for that day or other means. What map should you use? This is a cropped map of uh, the OC parks. It cut, cuts off the, the lower part of Upper Newport Bay, I guess. And this gives you an idea of where the entrance is. It's off of University and Irvine. And um, again, it's just something, uh, it, it is a, the map is a work in progress. Uh, they know there's some deficiencies here. Um, trail routes on there are marked and uh, sometimes not quite as well signed as they could be, but um, this is part of the problem in managing an area like this is that not all of the trails are authorized. So they're still, they're still working on issues like that. So um, a, the, a new map is in the works and I don't have a timeline on that. Our hike route is a relatively easy one, relatively flat. So um, no, no strenuous climbs on this one. And this does show we're starting from an area just by the uh, Muth Interpretive Center. We're following pretty much along the, the bay itself, some pretty good panoramic views. And then eventually we will be coming along uh, the Bayview Trail, which is uh, just FYI, the, the only um, ADA accessible trail within the uh, county portion of this, this area, which is the area we're visiting today. So we're heading south pretty much initially and returning to the north. And when is the preserve open? Um, different answers depending on what you're looking for. The restrooms open bright and early, sometimes not so bright, and close at 4 p.m. Um, there are really no other restrooms available in the area. So sometimes uh, depending on your visit, that might be an important uh, thing to note just there. The parking lot's pretty much open during, during the day. Um, they do have occasionally nighttime events, and of course, they would extend those hours for those programs. And the Interpretive Center itself, the hours or the days have been revised. It's open from 10 to 4, Thursday through Sunday. They may expand that back um, once, once the dust has settled, so to speak. And there is also some limited street parking. And if you're trying to reach the trailhead, first you have to find um, well, first you have to find the area. There's two signs, much like the one in the, uh, the upper left and the sign coming, if you're coming down Irvine, this is how you would see it. 
but uh, the, uh, the sign at the parking lot is the same and is not obscured by vegetation. So basically you're looking for that uh, kind of brownish rectangular sign and the county logo at the top. And that's, that's what you're looking for. The image on the bottom is the, once you've reached the parking lot, there are signs there to direct you to find the Muth because at this point you still can't see it. That was intentional, but they did a little bit too good a job. So yeah, we, we talk sometimes when we're going on a, a hike in the wilderness about the 10 essentials. And here, I think we kind of have to have a little bit different list. You want to be comfortable, but you want to have uh, appropriate foot, footwear. I had a spot on one of my hikes there. It was a little wetter. Uh, we had some morning um, mist, rain, if you want to be generous. And uh, there was one, one muddy spot on the route. Um, so you, you want to be careful with that. Uh, binoculars, in, in my opinion, are, are a must. Um, you don't have to have anything fancy. And if you want to just enjoy it without ha having anything in your hands, that's good too. Um, if you have the extra time to stop and watch and, and kind of look a little bit harder, binoculars help you there. Almost guaranteed you're going to want to take a, a, a photograph or two. And number 10 is that the, having a tide chart app on your phone or looking ahead of time. Um, there are calendars uh, normally at the Moose Center. You can stop by and pick up a little tide book uh, for a quarter. Maybe they're free, but uh, th they did not print any <laughs> this year. But it's it's nice to know what uh, if you're wanting to see shorebirds and you're coming at a high tide. What you're going to see is a lot of shorebirds that use the word loafing. We're all they're all just hanging out. So if you want to see more activity there, you you would want to come at a lower tide and uh, mask. The, the trail is pretty much spread out. So even though there's a lot of people there, it's always good to, to bring it, uh, especially if you want to stop at the Muth Center afterwards. They do have a little gift shop and those funds help uh, go toward running the many programs that they have. Well, depending, there's a lot of access points to Upper Newport Bay uh, and they're not all well signed as far as it goes as with the rules and regulations. So what you, primarily need to know is pretty much applies anywhere like this and that's stay on the trail and don't feed or disturb the wildlife and people do interpret disturb a little differently but um, sometimes even stepping a little too close to get that good picture uh, if the animal's having to move be because of you and then granted you have to go from here to there at some point on a trail but uh, you you want you want to you don't want to do so unnecessarily and the park uh, rangers do a great job of trying to preserve the resources there while allowing you to have a good experience. So if you wanna know more specifically the rules, do, uh, do go onto their, their site or give them a call. They, they are pretty accessible folks. Um, John Wayne Airport is just down the road. So guaranteed if you're here and going on a hike of any length, you're, you're gonna hear uh, and see some airplanes going overhead and uh, Pretty well that after after a few of them you're, you're going to start tuning it out a little bit but uh, if we were doing an on-site tour very likely we'd have to stop a couple times and just let the plane go by uh, before we we can if we were if we were talking in the middle of a uh, you know providing information amy if i can interrupt um sure. i just wanted to to apologize there were a couple people in the waiting room that didn't get in my computer was not showing me that they wanted to get in oh, okay. so apologize we are literally just getting started on this um walk right now on slide this 16. Is the beginning right here Correct. yeah so um do you mind if i launch a poll and um get a little bit of information from folks sure perfect let me get that launched here go ahead and respond All right, well, we'll give you a little while to, we got a, two questions here. Um, have you ever visited the Bay? And uh, not necessarily this side, but any part of it. And uh, how did you hear about it? Yeah, I know you're watching second. that, Melanie. Yeah, so. 
maybe about 10 more seconds. And I'll also add if at any point you do have questions, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to me, Melanie Schlotterbeck, in the chat, and I will, uh, at specific locations, ask questions of Amy. So I'm going to end the poll right here, and we'll share the results. So Amy, do you want to walk through the poll results? Sure. All right, so um, we have a, a fair amount of folks. Most folks have either walked the bay or taken a bike ride, and that's probably most users. Um, kayaking, good, because that's my absolute favorite way. Um, I hope once you you see a picture toward the end, though, that uh, you might uh, take the time to drive back Bay Drive. And I actually, uh, no, never had the pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm glad everyone's been there. I, I actually did not ask about the equestrian experience, which is a possibility. Um, and most of you heard about it through the newsletter. So that's, that's pretty cool. Welcome aboard. Great, I'll um, stop sharing the results. You're likely gonna need to close it on your end as a participant. And um, Jeannie added that uh, she has um, done biking and uh, walking at the bay as well, so. Yeah. All right, so um, I kind of blew a stop sign there with the poll. So this is the exact starting point of, uh, officially of our hike if we were gathering as a group. And um, <clears throat> truth be told, if we were doing a physical hike, there is a, um, a path from the parking lot. And if we had a larger, a large group, we would probably want to start from there because, as you can see, there's not exactly a lot of, a lot of room here to start. But uh, you'll, you'll see pretty early on, uh, I think, why I chose it. So essentially, if you, if you cross, if you don't see that sign, um, hiking only sign, um, no horses allowed on this trail, no bikes. You see the steps, but if you if you continue over the, on the bridge over the Delhi Channel, then you know you've you've gone too far. So back up. And at this point, um, you you've passed the Muth Building, uh, possibly stopped uh, to use the restroom and so forth. Um, ask a question or two. But uh, so this is if you're coming from the parking lot or the street parking, this is past that. You would be going um, essentially to the left. Um, I've, I've been a naturalist for quite some time and uh, um, not so many years ago there wasn't any, uh, well, this isn't the, um, this is a friendly fence. So there wasn't any fencing and so forth. There weren't any signs. We had a lot of residents who um, had had ac open access to the bay for quite some time. So you had, you had people who would not understand why they couldn't go places all of a sudden and so forth. So it, it took some years before people began to get that sense of ownership and understanding, uh, having the Moose Center there and a strong ranger presence um, and lots of volunteers out there doing programs or just kind of out, out taking a walk and so forth. So, so this is um, the signage, plus it's also uh, a look at the Dell Light Channel. Um, you occasionally will see birds. It looks like there's a, a coot in the water there, but um, several points throughout this presentation, since you aren't physically on site and you don't have your binoculars, we will kind of do that for you. So we've walked uh, not very far and you can see back uh, to where we've been. Um, you can see the steps we came down, that bridge that takes us over the Delhi Channel. The Delhi Channel continues upstream and uh, we're gonna be talking about that. This is one of the two primary freshwater sources for the estuary and estuary is an area essentially where freshwater and saltwater mix. And the saltwater influence is the Pacific Ocean obviously, but uh, the freshwater source, well, this, this is one of them. And off to the left is the Muth Interpretive Center. And uh, this, the trail uh, splits at this point. So this, this is not the, the friendliest um, trail. That's one that in the future may, may be closed off and keep the bottom route, but uh, they, they, they have a lot of challenges there. So this is probably not quite high on their priority list. 
This is a map of the watersheds that they make up 154 square miles of watersheds within this map that we're seeing. And there's sub watersheds, which are all highlighted in yellow. And so if you live in one of these areas, and, and a lot of you do, um, if you're out there um, or a neighbor washing your car in the driveway or in the street and you see those signs drains to ocean, it, it does here, but it goes to the bay first. Um, so that, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. There are water quality monitoring stations, a little symbol uh, bottom left. Um, so you'll see those as you kind of proceed in the bay itself and uh, upstream a ways. And those help provide a lot of valuable information. And then we see the Michelson uh, Irvine Ranch Water District Michelson site. Um, adjacent to that is the uh, San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary and uh, just a wonderful place to visit. And you know, a lot of those birds um, are, are really enjoying the best of both worlds, having that upstream habitat and access to the bay, the bay just, just uh, um, as the crow flies, not very far away whatsoever. And obviously this map is a, about 12 years old, um, the El Toro Marine Corps Air Station, not there anymore. So again, you can see uh, the sections of split trail there on the high road, low road type of thing, the low road being the more accessible and you're seeing the Delhi channel and uh, it's gonna work its way around and we'll see more images of that. There is a self-guided tour that can be taken uh, along this route. There's 10 of these uh, little, little kiosks, if you will, little nooks with a short uh, trail leading you into it. A number of rocks that are convenient to sit on or stand on if you wanna get a higher view. Um, and the information in these signs is just incredible. This one's talking about the estuary and why estuaries matter. And the short version is that um, a lot of the marshes, wetlands, estuaries uh, uh, in our state and, and elsewhere throughout the country um, it, were removed or filled in, leveled whatever for, uh, for humans or one species. All right, so this is the Peter and Mary Muth Interpretive Center. If we, uh, if you had parked in the parking lot, you would have walked uh, in front of, in, in the view we have here. This is the front of the building. You would have walked from the left to the right. The normal access is in the middle, a little bit to the left, but right now with uh, the pandemic, they were still uh, directing people around, well, they were closed for quite some while but they are directing people around to the side. And so there's uh, either a staff or a volunteer and you come in and another at the uh, exit as well. Some of the displays have been closed down, but there's still some good information. Um, a lot of other wonderful facilities in there as well, including a library and, uh, um, and, and other facilities. So the restroom just FYI is uh, kind of in the middle of the building. So here we're seeing the channel and the marsh and the homes and so forth. It is, as we saw in the earlier maps, pretty much completely enveloped except for the, well, it's completely enveloped because at the, the lower end, uh, we have the ocean, but between the upper Newport Bay and, uh, and the ocean, we have the lower bay. All right, our first wildlife sighting. Um, a pair of mallards, and I'll let your eyes adjust because you're probably drawn to the male, more colorful uh, duck, and uh, and that's as it should be because the female ducks, if you see, uh, mallards are, are pretty, most people know mallards, even, even the female and stuff, but female ducks are, as a rule, are drab, and if you see them without the male, sometimes they're a little hard to identify, so you have to start looking more closely at where the colors are and any, anything you can do to try and get an identification. Some birds, it's some ducks, it's easier than others. And these guys are in pickleweed. The pickleweed, uh, this is not really part of the salt marsh, but this plant is adapted to saltier soils. And when it gets too much salt in it, uh, it simply turns red and breaks off. So that's what we're seeing a little bit here over to the left. And these guys are dabblers. So when you see them out in the water, um, they, they have filtering bills and uh, 
They're usually just out there. No, they're, they're not going to dive. There's diving ducks and dappling ducks, and these are dapplers. So this is a, a good shot of the, the channel beginning to curve. Uh, prickly pear cactus occasionally used as, uh, as fencing in some respects. And it's also good habitat for several of the threatened and endangered species that lived here, in particular the uh, coastal cactus wren. So you can see you, you're starting that way when you get started a little bit, you can kind of forget to some extent that you're, you're in the middle of the city. And here's where we got the binoculars out for you. Um, this is a Western fence lizard. Uh, you're not gonna see a lot of wildlife on the trail as a rule. You're gonna see birds uh, sometimes in the air, sometimes in the ground, uh, sometimes in the vegetation. Uh, lizards such as this one and uh, sometimes darkling beetles walking across the trail. The darkling beetles are the ones you kind of have to watch for because they can't scoot out of your way. And uh, so yeah, just be, be watching on the trail. If you see somebody like this coming out or he's, he's just sitting there uh, as you approach, you know, give him a second because I mean, that's, that's the cool thing about nature is when you're given a chance to observe natural behavior. If you begin to approach and it scurries, that, that's, that's a, a, a different kind of behavior entirely, but uh, that, that we will have, uh, we've, seen a, we've seen a pair of ducks and we've seen a lizard, so not too bad since we've just got started. And Amy, can we pause again for some questions and a poll? Oh, sure. Excellent. So I'll remind everyone that if you have any questions, please put them in the chat uh, for me, Melanie Schlotterbeck, and I'll launch the second poll here. Melanie's keeping me honest on the polls. <laughs> All right. What do bald eagles, peregrine falcon, brown pelicans, and osprey have in common? We'll give you, give you a few moments. All right, maybe 10 more seconds or so. Get your last votes in. All right, let's share the results. Um, little, little bit of a trick question here in a way. I, um, I had to do a lot of homework and relearn stuff that I'd forgotten essentially. The answer is all of the above. Uh, the peregrine falcon, um, it, again, there, of course, it's a trick question. <laughs> if you had this one on exam, I, I, I'd fight this one with the teacher if you got it wrong. Um, they will basically take fish from other creatures. They'll steal somebody else's food. Um, so they, they don't necessarily go fishing, but they, they do eat fish. So all of the above in this case. Um, DDT will be talking about that uh, uh, more as we, we move through the presentation. Perfect. So I'll stop sharing the results. Uh, two questions that um, sure. I have. Uh, one of them is, are there other places in Orange County where you're going to see similar types of birds? Oh, absolutely. Um, not a lot of them, however. The uh, San Joaquin Wildlife Sanctuary, you will see some of, those, some of these birds, but that is a, a freshwater environment. So again, some of these go between those habitats. Some of them are more specialized. Um, Bolsa Chica, there's uh, the smaller Talbert Marsh. So there, there, there are a, a couple of sites. And if I've missed one, uh, Melanie, uh, jump in. But those, those are the biggies. So Bolsa Chica is, is a little further to the north uh, along access to, from Pacific Coast Highway. So all, all are great visits. Uh, each has their own feel. Talbert is pretty small. Um, so it's just kind of a, a little bit of a taster. Was there another question? Yeah, the second question is about the vegetation. Um, is it, it's a coastal site clearly, but is it always this green? Well, um, no. <laughs> I, there may be some restoration areas that are irrigated. Uh, if, if they're new, generally they only irrigate for a few years once, once a project uh, is uh, is begun and uh, 
this is a, these are spring photos at the beginning. Uh, I know a few of you missed that. These photos were taken early March and uh, fairly early in April. So we're, we're seeing, I know we didn't get a lot of rain this year, but we got enough to green up the plants. Um, you wanna see more blooms and more green, definitely springtime and by summer, yeah, a lot of this vegetation is, is gonna brown out at least to some degree. Great, and we have had, oops, sorry, a truck is driving by. Um, we, we have a, another question that has uh, popped in. Can you kayak the entire back bay from PCH to Jamboree? That, that is a great question. And um, we're gonna see a picture later that kind of pretty much shows uh, how far you can go. I just have to remember to, to bring that up again, but you, you cannot uh, kayak the whole way. And the reason is, it's again, a management decision to um, allow you access to parts of the, the, the well, it's a ecological reserve and a preserve. So we got both. Um, so it is uh, allowing you access, but you can't go past the salt dike and the salt dike is not visible yet in this sh shot. They do have signs out in the water and they, they are trying to improve that signage but uh, sometimes it can be a little confusing. Sometimes you will see folks uh, out in areas where they're not supposed to be. So don't go by what, what others are doing. Um, uh, you, you can stop at one of the facilities, uh, the, the Moose Center being the best, the other one's not uh, as readily accessible, uh, the Back Bay Science Center, um, but no. So you can't kayak the full length, but believe me, um, you pretty much have to be, well, not an Olympian. You have to be in really good shape because you're going to be fighting wind one direction or another, and sometimes you're fighting the tide as well. So generally, as far as you can go on a kayak is good enough for most folks. Great. Um, perfect. We'll go ahead and continue on with the presentation. Um, okay. So what else do I want to say? Okay. So this is a, another one of those information chaos I was talking about. I'm not going to go uh, discuss all of the the content in here. Um, just mention uh, a few of the birds featured um, since since that's kind of, you know, these are the bird neighborhoods they're talking about here in the sign. The great blue heron, if you don't have binoculars and he's not there uh, feeding in the upland areas, um, and you might ask, I see him eating a fish and there are no fish in the upland areas. However, this morning, uh, my, my dog is at doggy daycare today and uh, coming home from that I, I have to pass through Fairview Park and there was a great blue heron on the hill hoping to catch a squirrel or a gopher. Um, so they do sometimes whether it's a nutrition thing or whether it's a preference thing or whether it's I you know they, they won't tell but uh, so those are hard to see and binoculars will bring them out. The bird on the lower left is a male common yellow throat bright bright plumage, very easy to identify. And they do a witchety witchety song or call, excuse me, that you might hear. And so that's a bird that if you start hearing the witchety witchety, um, and you'll know it, I'm close enough. I guess I'm in the ballpark there. Um, definitely kind of stop and look around. Um, they, 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 if they pop out, it's going to be quick. Um, they're, they're, they're active birds. Hummingbirds all, almost guaranteed, at least in the spring, that you're going to have one or more hummingbird sightings. And the big bird at the top, the raptor or bird of prey, is a female northern harrier. And I say that because it's brown and a few, uh, the males are gray. But if it were doing what, uh, if, if it were in flight, normally where we would see it would be flying low over the marsh and you would see a white rump patch, and that is a key identifying feature. You don't always get this view because they're flying too low. And we're talking a little bit about adaptations in this presentation. We don't have time to kind of go into great depth and I, I don't have enough of that um, uh, scientific background to, to, to get into that kind of uh, detail but it gives you a pretty general view that there's a lot of variety here just on these two parts of the bird alone. We saw the mallard with the filtering bill. We're gonna be talking about mud flats and the probing bill. This time of year, you will go out into areas like this pretty much throughout a lot of Orange County and you're gonna see swallows and swifts. 
flying uh, up above catching insects that you can't see. And there's ones closer down uh, as well and that aren't as fast and hard to observe. Lots of seed eating bills also, the finches and the uh, sparrows we see a lot. The tearing meat, um, the turkey vulture, I forgot to make them do the turkey vulture thing, Melanie. Um, the turkey vulture has a tearing meat bill, but it is not, uh, it does not catch live prey. It, it catches roadkill, essentially things that have died and been left behind. And of course, woodpeckers uh, really aren't, uh, there, yeah, there are some woodpeckers around, but they're not seen very often. Uh, you're gonna find them um, not, not so much on this side, I would say more on the east side uh, of the bay. And, uh, but you might hear them drumming. You'll, you'll, you'll know that rat-a-tat-tat because it's usually repeated a number of times. To uh, on on the, the feet, uh, the top one is the duck, but the next one down is the coot. And those are the two um, um, uh, most common ones. And then of course down from there. So we see their toes and sometimes we see three toes in the front and sometimes it's two in the front, two in the back. So it really just depends what that bird's purpose is, what the objective is and the kind of food and what kind of adaptations it will have along these lines. And of course, all birds have feathers and they are the only creatures on the planet that do, although their ancestors, uh, some, of the, some of the dinosaurs of uh, way long ago uh, are, are found to have had feathers. So that, that's pretty cool. And feathers is a whole, whole presentation in and of itself. So we have the, this is a segment of the Pacific Flyway. Um, Melanie pointed out to me this morning that it's uh, National Migratory Bird Day. World Migratory Bird World Day. Migratory. And, and actually, yes, I, I did look that up after you said that. And so in Canada and the United States, we celebrate at this time of year, it, you go south, Mexico, Central America and South America, they celebrate it in October. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool thing because these birds need the stops. I've just highlighted a few that you may have heard of and just to kind of illustrate some of the, uh, some of the larger ones, I guess. Um, birds use a lot of, a tremendous amount of energy. Their flights vary. Uh, there are resident bird populations. Not all migratory birds migrate. I guess I'll say it that way, that some, some have pretty much everything they need and will breed in the same location where they live. Others have a journey of, uh, I think the Arctic turn is 22,000 miles uh, so forth. So it's, it's, it's quite the haul and uh, something to keep in mind of when we're talking about World Migratory Bird Day is that um, it's an international effort to make sure that we have the, 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 the sites that we need for some of these birds to complete their journey. And I should I said birds, but there, there are bats and other creatures that travel as well. So, um, yeah, important to take care of the whole route. So this is the osprey. We mentioned DDT. Um, this, all of those birds suffered from exposure to DDT and it had the effect of making their eggs, eggshells so thin that when they sat on them like this, they would crush them. And it's still an issue. We've uh, had recovery with this species in particular, uh, erecting nesting platforms. They're, they, they very readily utilize human-made structures. Um, they put a platform up on Shellmaker Island. 13 years it sat there unused until the osprey began nesting on it. And these are birds with a sense of humor apparently because they had just begun construction of the Back Bay Science Center and that was held up while they completed that. So at some point they did uh, a few years back move the nest uh, to a, a more suitable location given what they now knew and the fact that it was being used, they knew they would come back to it. So um, they do have an osprey cam as it says there, but it's not fully operational at this point. It's mostly a funding issue. So hopefully, hopefully sometime in the not too distant future, they'll get those issues resolved. But uh, so it's the Newport Bay Conservancy is kind of the volunteer branch and that's where you would go to look and see when they get that camera up and running. And this is a little guy. This is a song sparrow. Um, lots of little sparrows and finches are around, uh, one of which is uh, endangered, but that one you don't tend to see as much because you're not in its habitat. This one, however, is a, the song sparrow has that little black 
chest patch, and that makes it somewhat easy to identify, although I, I looked it up just to, just to make sure. So again, another wildlife sighting. And as you can see, the channel is now snaking toward the main, the main uh, open waters. All right, an oasis for our scaly friends. One of the signs and what does it have to do with birds? Well, we have birds that eat lizards and snakes, quite a few of them. And we have snakes that will eat birds and bird eggs. So it's definitely uh, definitely part of the, the, we've got a food chain thing going on here. We, I won't say you'll, you won't see a rattlesnake there. You, there's no signs up. Uh, there's no reports of them being in the area, but um, I always kind of keep my, my eyes open. Uh, just as a rule, it's a good practice. But you might, uh, if you're if you're lucky, in my opinion, see a, a gopher snake, and that one's shown on the bottom, or a king snake. Um, there's a number of different lizard species. We saw the western fence lizard, that's on the lower left, and uh, that's that's probably the one you're most likely to see. They mentioned the alligator lizard as well, but they're pretty quick moving, so um, you, you you'd be lucky to get a glimpse of those guys. And this is the view you see from that same sign. So those homes across the way enjoy a beautiful view every day. Okay, someone asked uh, about kayaking. Uh, this is the salt dike and the, that berm that you see starting uh, in the bottom uh, toward the left and arcing over uh, through the shot. Uh, Turn Island is the area that we then see off to the right. Um, so this is as far as you can kayak up the bay and the bay continues for quite a while and turns shortly after this uh, toward Jamboree uh, and so forth. And the photo is a least turn chick. So this island was actually moved. <laughs> they, I, I got quotes around the word moved. The, they still have an island in the upper most part of the bay and black skimmers, for the most part, nest there. We'll be talking more about them shortly. But as you can see, that, that chick is on the nest and it blends in, it camouflages because, you know, otherwise the birds flying up above, those you from above are gonna see those guys and swoop down. They kind of know anyway. I mean, they're looking for stuff like that. So it's very vulnerable, very exposed. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how we keep the, the island in that condition. But the previous uh, location was um, not uh, abandoned, but uh, was, was this, this location was selected because in the lower, the other island, Hot Dog Island, they call it, they actually created a basin there for sediment coming in through the San Diego Creek Channel. The idea being that then you don't have to have barges coming and going every few years that uh, in theory, and we're still somewhere in the middle of that period, uh, you only have to do the dredging every 30 years or so, because not only uh, do you have the presence of the barges and the traffic coming and going, which is disruptive to people and wildlife, but you have to uh, go through the permit process and find uh, places to deposit that material. And just, just another view, we're getting away. I actually don't see the move in this one, but we see some of that upland habitat we've been seeing. Um, it looks like we have some choya in here. The encelia is the yellow flowering plant. Uh, a number of the different upland plants. Uh, and, and these slopes are fairly well vegetated on the east side. They seem to have more of a problem with uh, slope failure. And uh, just recently they completed uh, another project to kind of stabilize the slope and so forth. So the homes aren't necessarily in danger, but they, they might have in some cases a little bit less backyard than they used to, but this side seems pretty stable. And did you want to play that video, Amy? Thank you so much. That's essentially what you'd say if you were standing there and looked from left to right. So you're looking from north to south, essentially. Human impacts. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through most parts of the sign other than to say that uh, we have a Native American presence here. Um, I actually like this sign. I've seen others uh, that just talk about the Gabrielino 
This refers to them in both respects, the Gabrielino and the Tungva. The Tungva is a name that they chose for themselves. And then of course we have the period from pretty much the 1800s on where the McFadden's and the Irvine's and so forth, um, Newport Beach is, has the name it does because they created a port there. So it was the new port. So we have Newport Beach. So we have a lot of history going on. It shows the shell making operation on uh, Shellmaker Island, which we'll see a little bit later on. We're gonna talk more about that wonderful couple here in just a moment. So that's the Muth Interpretive Center in the distance. Um, the two couples I wanna talk about is Frank and Francis Robinson. And they basically, um, we'll, we'll be talking about this off and on throughout, but their son went down to use the, the, the beach. Um, the kids, they could ride their bikes down to the beach and play in the sand. They could dig for clams, all the things that they could do. Um, and he went down shortly after they had moved into this area. And there was Irvine Company signs up there saying private, private property, no access. He went back and told mom and dad and they started asking questions and found out that there was a land swap between the Irvine Company and the County of Orange that had been proposed and started looking into it a little bit more and deemed that um, it, this needed to be stopped because it wasn't, it wasn't legal. It involved public tithe lands that were being exchanged when they weren't really supposed to be allowed to do so. So the group called the Friends of Newport Bay uh, was formed and uh, well, you know, that battle was won, uh, but as Frank Robinson said, the battle is, the battle is never over. Um, little, little things keep coming up. And the Muths, the center is named after Peter and Mary, and uh, they put a million dollars in the pot to, to get this thing going. And that was actually lost when the county went bankrupt some years ago. Um, and that's actually, that, that action is the same reason that the Friends of Harbors, or the, yeah, Friends of Harbors Beaches and Parks was formed. Um, to kind of keep an eye on what was going on at that time because funds were being diverted and so forth. So hu human impacts are, are both negative and, and positive. So here's our island again, and there's a picture of the uh, least turn as an adult. The island is cleared because it resembles a beach that way, which is where this bird prefers to nest in those kinds of areas, sandy areas. So this year in, in, in our COVID uh, related environment, normally they have volunteers and they take them out in the electric boats and so forth and all the equipment we need. And they go out there and, you know, just some backbreaking work to try and get as much done. Usually one time, sometimes they'll come out a couple different times. Uh, this year, the uh, staff <laughs> dropped a lawnmower off and, <laughs> and got the job done pretty much by, by himself and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a tough job, um, but it's when you see those, those chicks uh, and so forth, you see the adults flying around and this is the smallest, the least turn is the smallest of uh, the various turn species you see here, but it's, um, it, it's just, it's, it's endangered and it's, management will be ongoing maybe because there's have so much habitat has disappeared. The pictures that I uh, took throughout were at uh, kind of a lower tide and then it was uh, approaching a high tide on, on the, the second visit, but there are high, high tides. And this is uh, this debris that we're seeing there was deposited during one of those uh, times and so forth. And I, thankfully, I'm not seeing a lot of trash in there. There have been efforts to reduce that trash and they do pickups uh, once a year where the general public is invited out to go to various sites, places you probably wouldn't go to otherwise. And volunteers, trained volunteers, are sometimes allowed to go out in kayaks and other craft uh, and pick up debris from other areas that aren't accessible and, and probably not advisable for the general public. So when you see all that debris down there and you wonder what's going on, that's what's going on. And an old trail, again, there used to be a lot of old trails and that one's not well utilized anymore. More than mud, mud flats. Okay, we're gonna, we're, there's a lot of birds, uh, a lot of species that utilize mud flats. One of our endangered birds, formerly known as the clapper rail, now known as the Ridgeway rail, will sometimes be seen uh, coming out onto the mud flats looking for crabs and, and snails and things. And 
you have to look really hard, even with the arrows. Um, those are little horn snails. And when the tide goes out, they simply, if that's where they are, they just kind of seal themselves off to the best of their ability and wait for the tide to arrive again. And so I don't, I didn't count how many are there, but there's, there's, there's a few. And uh, the bird tracks, well, given the size of the horn snail, which is maybe about an inch or so, um, that th those tracks tell us that it's a small shore bird. It's not a duck, it's not a heron or any of the other birds we, we might see in that area. So this is, this is a, a small section of bud flat. Uh, there's about 40,000 40, organisms in a cubic inch of mud. So there, there's a lot of life teeming in that mud flat. More habitats equal more wildlife. Uh, open water to uplands are just two of the habitats that you will see. And what's cool about this site is that you can see all six. You can see the open water. We're on the uplands. There's freshwater channels, uh, freshwater marshes, the marsh itself. And the fact that you've got all those different habitats here. Um, there was a question earlier speaking to are there other areas uh, like this in the county? And I think this is one of the things that makes this site unique, having, having all, all of that habitat there. Limited though it is, packed in by development as it is, the, uh, the birds and the insects have it, have it a lot easier that that can be more mobile. Um, the wildlife, like uh, well, your animals, like your bobcat and so forth, they, it, it helps when they have corridors or areas where they can travel between one site and another. And it's kind of a topic for another day. Amy, if I can pause for just a moment. Um, we do have one question that came in about the difference between a preserve and a reserve. Okay, that one, I, I, uh, it's a management issue, essentially. Um, I, I, th I believe the, 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 the different des designations afford more protections, like the, uh, uh, the east side is the Upper New Bay Ecological Reserve, and that, that, that has stricter management requirements. But uh, I'd love to give you a better answer, but it's been a long time since that. I looked one up, and sometimes, truth be told, I think the terms are used interchangeably. Um, uh, the, yeah. I'll just add that reserves are a classification used by Cal Fish and Wildlife um, and preserves are a unit of the OC Park system. Um, and I'll also at this point do a time check for you. Okay. Yep, we're picking up a little bit. So this is, this is a fork in the road and what it looked like on my first oops, pass. Uh, my, my attempt to go this way failed, but a month later, it was open and uh, proved to be actually the more interesting route. I wouldn't have had this channel and seen the mallard pair and their chicks. Uh, the job of a nature preserve, again, going back to that title, this is the only park currently designated as a nature preserve. Talbert used to be so designated, but uh, that designation was changed at one point. And there's that cactus run I was mentioning about and gnat catchers, and uh, I've only had the privilege of seeing burrowing owls once, um, uh, and it was not at Upper Newport, but this speaks to the fact that there are a number of trails and how you can uh, be part of the solution by, by volunteering, and it, you can be a one-time volunteer. And this, a little bit fast on this one, sorry. And would you like to launch the poll after this video? Yes, ma'am. All right. So we're the asking you what you think is the greatest threat facing up in Newport Bay today, currently. Ten more seconds. All right. 
All right. Um, pollution and trash. Um, I, we mentioned those water quality monitoring stations. There used to be horrific algae blooms in the bay years ago. Those have largely subsided because there were nurseries upstream and material coming into the bay that you couldn't see, but we're, we're feeding those algae blooms. So pollution and trash is definitely a threat. But climate change, um, if, if the water level uh, rises by five feet, uh, as it is predicted may happen, um, a lot of the habitat um, utilized by um, the clapper or the, <laughs> the ridgeway rails and the salt marsh bird's beak, which is an endangered plant. Um, um, yeah, it, it, the, land, the land and the water will still be there in some form, but a lot of the species just simply won't have any place else to be. And did you have any questions or are we gonna save until the end? Uh, I don't have any more questions. Okay. All right, this bird announced its uh, arrival by honking and there is a more clear view of a Canada geese coming overhead. Uh, you wanna find out if you have a birder in your midst, call them Canadian geese and they will correct you uh, either out loud or not. There's the bridge we saw in the shot. There was a wildlife cam off to the right. I don't know if it's operational 24 seven or if they have a way to just do nighttime viewing because otherwise it would generate an awful lot of pictures. This is the view from that bridge which is gorgeous, even though in my, my eye, I'm looking at all the non-native stuff in this whole area. And this, these are insect galls on a willow. Willow is a freshwater plant, and these little sawflies will emerge with very little damage to the plant overall and provide food for various creatures, including quite a few birds, especially this time of year. A lot of birds that eat like nectar or or vegetation will this time of year to provide nutrition for the family will eat more bugs. Snowy egret, uh, we see him kind of in the middle of the screen down toward the bottom. Um, I say snowy because uh, I'm, I'm, it's my best guess at that point. Sometimes a, the great egret can scrunch down a little bit, but the way you tell the difference between them at a distance, if you can see the color of the bill, because you often won't see the feet, um, it's reversed on the great egret. So yellow bill on the great egret, black feet. Now these are willets coming in. And as you see from the, the, the enlarged binocular view for you, um, they're pretty nondescript bird. The talking about mud flats, that's about a medium length bill. But when they're flying, you see that black and white wing pattern. And that, that ID these birds, uh, and made identification of a few other birds we'll see. There's a little tiny uh, sparrow or finch out on the post in the middle of the water, uh, a little shorebird or plover of some kind uh, on, on the shore in the bottom right, and more willets coming in. I shot like 20 of these pictures. I promise I'm not showing them all, but um, this is the bird we see coming in over the open water in that first shot. They were coming in as well. I had to pull my book out as because my my brain told me I was seeing turns, and this is a turn relative, but uh, it's just it's just awesome if you're out there on the kayaks. Um, sometimes these guys will fly right right between your the kayaks and so forth on a tour, and they're the only bird that exists that has a lower mandible that's longer um, than the top, and it actually just drops its bottom part of its bill into the water, and it, it looks for fish that way. Worn feathers. Um, <laughs> You see animal signs sometimes. We saw the, the galls um, and we, we've seen this and basically back way back at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of birds died to put feathers on women's hats. And so that's pretty much where the Audubon Society came from and eventually legislation passed. And uh, um, yeah, that, that was not, not a good day for the birds, but the egrets uh, now are again quite common, the great blue herons and other species. So at the turnaround, uh, pretty much, we see a lot of signage that speaks to uh, protected areas. There are a number of different marine protected areas uh, that are essentially designed to protect bi biological diversity. And uh, the snowy plover, this is a sign 
put out by the city. It reminds you that your dogs need to be leashed because as we saw with the turn and we see in this photo here of the, uh, looks like a one-legged bird, but he's just got the other leg tucked up, um, is that you, you can do a lot of damage by bringing your dog in. And this actually has specific hours. Um, there's a lot of information on that sign, how much, how many people with dogs actually read through, I don't know. And that just what you see from the street, there's homes right across the way. You, you come out in the middle of a neighborhood here. So we're at the turnaround, we're going back now, the way we came, except we're following, we're following the paved bike path, uh, uh, but we're on an unpaved portion adjacent to it. Protected enclave again speaks, there's the clapper rail on the bottom. Um, excuse me, Ridgeway Rail. I think my brain says clapper rail still. 25 years ago and at a clapper rail on. And there's salt marsh bird's beak, that plant I mentioned. Again, with climate change, uh, the water level, level comes up. Um, the the uh, Ridgeway Rail makes its nest using cord grass and it likes tall cord grass. And that's one reason Epinupa Bay has most of the remaining uh, members of that, that, that bird species. And um, the nests float up, but I, you can only do that to a point. There's a lot of man-made nesting structures. And one gentleman who's been monitoring those birds, uh, except for this last year, I guess, he couldn't get in and do all of his work. But um, yeah, that's the, the, those, those are species we would probably lose. Same shot in April, but a lot more mustard. And animal sign, you see tracks, human tracks. This is an equestrian part of the trail. Uh, this photo was obviously taken when the ground was soft because as we can see, some of these tracks sunk in pretty deep. And I didn't notice it at the time or I would have investigated a little bit more closely, but there was somebody with four toes that's coming, uh, basically it's moving the opposite direction as the most of the people tracks are and so forth. So coy coyote or bobcat is all I can say at this point. And here begins our, our, our quick tour on the base, since I know time-wise we're, we're kind of pushing the envelope here. So there's our osprey. We saw on the nest before, but it looks like in flight. I just wanted to point that out because that's more likely how you're gonna see it. So you look for that black at the wrist. And the various stars, um, the first star um, is, is where the next slide's gonna be. And all those, most of those stars, I guess I'll say on the east side, are the length of Back Bay Drive, which I, I did do this day and I, I don't do very often, probably not often enough. North Star Beach is where Jay Robinson came down and saw that sign all those years ago. And that is the Back Bay Science Center. They do shark tanks over there. Uh, hopefully that those kind of activities will resume soon. This is from Upper Castaways. Uh, the, the residents or a group involved with the city of Newport Beach actually had a ballot measure at one time trying to preserve this land. It failed, but uh, um, so we, we have Upper Castaways Park and there is a Lower Castaways Park. So we do have some, some nice buffer habitat uh, in a key location. Back Bay View Park, um, both of these last parks are a little bit, well, all, all three of the ones I've shown so far are a little bit challenging to find. Um, this one took me several years to figure out, you know, I kept looking, where's the access point? You essentially have to park on Back Bay Drive and walk into the dunes and you'll see the entrance to the trail uh, right by the, the, uh, the where, you, where you pay, where the attendants are. So a beautiful view. Back Bay Drive, again, I only have one slide here, even though I showed a lot of stars. We see, uh, it's not a kayak, I don't think, but we see a craft out in the water all by themselves. And uh, it's uh, up, up ahead to the, uh, on the right-hand side is one of the few areas that you can legally fish from shore. Uh, and this is just prior to Big Canyon, uh, which is an awesome spot to visit. And if you don't wanna drive the entire length, you don't have to. There is a San Joaquin Hills Road comes in in the middle, so you could drive a, a portion of it. Vista Point is at the uh, upper part of Upper Newport Bay. And in the few minutes I was here at this site, I saw several children reading the different signs here, which is just beautiful. Frank and Fran Robinson in that picture and this one as well. Their son, Jay, uh, that, that then child of, I think 12 years old that visited the beach all those years ago as an adult and helped fund uh, this memorial and the, uh, 
um, uh, dedication of this, this site, which includes several uh, informational signs and that nice viewing scope. And this is uh, looking toward the San Diego Creek that is the main fresh water source where, where a lot of those monitoring uh, stations we saw were upstream. And sometimes when the winds are strong, you will see planes coming in backwards. As I say, you'll see them coming in um, for a landing instead of taking off over the bay. And at this point, uh, we're gonna open it up to questions in just one minute, but uh, you, uh, by signing up for this hike, you uh, will get quarterly newsletters and action alerts. We do have another hike in July, and I think one more in the fall. The next one is a Woods. Yep. And And uh, most, a lot of you heard about us on Facebook, and that is wonderful. Twitter as well. Amazon Smile. I, I did a lot of shopping this year uh, uh, at Christmas time on Amazon Smile, and a small portion of those proceeds goes to organizations like us. Or you can just make a donation outright if you're not doing any online shopping. At this point, uh, I know some of you may need to bug out. I ran about five minutes long. Um, and this is a picture of a, it looks like a nice leisurely ride and how far they went. There, is, there are still a couple of stables nearby. And Melanie, do we, with that, do we have any questions? I do wanna thank the people that donated pictures and Melanie for her assistance in developing this program. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, is Upper Newport Bay protected in perpetuity? Yes, yes and no. There was actually a recent threat to a small amount of acreage um, that was going to be, um, Mel Melanie probably knows more of the specifics, but this was just very recently, um, just, just kind of that threat uh, ended at least for the time being um, just a few days ago. At uh, one time, I want to say it could have been about 15 years ago, maybe maybe a little longer, um, there was an effort to put Extend University from over on the Irvine side over and connecting um, over, over the bay and so forth. And that had to be fought. It's just like, you know, kind of the, the our modern equivalent would be the, the tow road that keeps re resurfacing, wanting to go through some, some awesome land. So yes, it is protected in perpetuity, but threats threats to the Bay's integrity are ongoing. And we're dependent on um, making sure that through watching Board of Supervisors and City Council and Coastal Commission agendas, that we can see what some of those threats might be and call out the so-called troops to help. So we appreciate everyone that signed the petition with this latest threat, um, which was averted and uh, was going to sell off part of Upper Newport Bay to a private property owner. So glad that outcome ended the way it did. And the next question is about mustard. Uh, the question is whether it's harmful or helpful for the habitat. Well, mustard is a kind of a nuisance plant and that um, the genie is out of the bottle. We'll never, we'll never get it back in. Uh, when, when we have a, a good rainfall year, the mustard can be eight foot tall. So um, this time uh, it's probably, probably about waist high, but it still produces a tremendous amount of seed material and uh, there's the native plants offer better habitats. So um, yeah, we, of the list of noxious weeds, it's, it's not super high up. Uh, there's other plants like Russian thistle, uh, pampas grass and so forth. Um, so it, it, is, it is an on, ongoing battle, but and it is, controlled mostly in restoration projects. Excellent. And the last question on the list from Kelvin is, how has climate change, temperature, and water salinity fluctuations affected bird migration and mating patterns? Wow, that, that, that's the, the scientist question. Um, one of the things that was sent to me in, in asking for photos uh, from um, several sources was a report from last year's um, data gathering on Turn Island, and I haven't had time to read that report yet, which might might have provided a, a, a more coherent answer to your question. The impacts are there. Um, there are uh, agency biologists uh, from the De California Department of Fish and Wildlife and from OC Parks as resource specialists, including uh, 
one of the gentlemen that donated uh, at least one of the pictures used and so forth. So they're monitoring this. And in fact, uh, restoration projects that are either ongoing or planned are now incorporating projected impacts of climate change. So they're trying to they're trying to stay a little bit ahead of the curve, knowing knowing that uh, if if we don't kind of rein this in a little bit, that the impacts are going to be far beyond our ability to control. But uh, yeah, that would be a good question for Nathan uh, at at OC Parks or uh, Ellen as as the maybe the ranger there. Okay, uh, so those are those are all the questions I have. Um, I'll say thank you to everyone. We'll be sending a follow up email. Uh, not only a link to the video that will be posted on YouTube, but also a survey to tell us what you thought of the virtual hike and uh, areas that we can improve or things that you enjoyed. Uh, we do wanna thank you for your time and thanks to Amy for, for offering her time and expertise in this as well. And our next one um, is gonna be July 10th with our board president, Mike Wellborn. And that will also be at 9 a.m. And the focus is Aliso and Wood Canyons. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank you. Time.